Hello and welcome to Crusader Kings 2, a Game of Thrones mod. We are going to be playing as Daenerys Targaryen, also known as Daenerys Stormborn. We're going to put her in her rightful place as Queen of the Seven Kingdoms. So, let's get started. Mother of Dragons, Salvation, the prophetic red comet has led you to Karth as you pass through the three immense and elegantly painted walls that serve as one of the nine wonders of man. You can't help but gaze at the bones of those who have been denied entry. Sheltered by Zaro Zaron Daxus, you quickly discover the politics of Karth to be a danger all its own. But danger does not stop the dragon. By burning the Lazarian Witch, you have laid claim to your birthright of fire and blood. The usurper is dead, Westeros is shattered, and you long for home. Use this time to nurse your dragons, and soon you will return to cast down the usurper's dogs and unite the Seven Kingdoms once more. I am the rightful queen. House Targaryen has ruled Westeros since Aegon's conquest. We united the Seven Kingdoms into one, we built King's Landing, we forged Iron Throne, and we will not let our birthright slip away. Fire and Blood, so we get claims on Dragonstone, which is over in Westeros, obviously. But we don't start there, we start in Karth, and we start uh, without actually having any holdings. We have one title, which is uh, a titular title, so it has no land associated with it. And the heir to that title is, at the moment, Jorah Mor Mormont, which uh, we're not going to die. Uh, just a heads up there. I'm fairly certain it is impossible for us to die at this point. We did have a son, but he is dead, and we have three dragons. So let's uh, set up what we're going to do first. Uh, first things first, we need to set up a council. Uh, just any roles that aren't filled. I think they're all filled to start with, actually. That's fine. We need to set someone to educate us. At the moment, we're being educated by Jorah, and he's uh, he's alright, but he only has a second level education talent, which isn't actually that good. We want to have a good education talent, so let's find somebody suitable. Let's see, is there a Grey Eminence around? No Grey Eminences. Uh, we've got a level 3 thing here. I guess uh, we're going for level 3... Um, is it stewardship? Yeah, stewardship one. So we'll go with that. He'll like us a little bit more, but it doesn't really matter. So our heir is unmarried, so we should get Jorah someone to marry. Let's, uh... How about Lady Sansa Stark? That seems like a suitable marriage. Go for that. We need to get married, and the reason I'm going to ignore this for now is we can't actually get married just now. There's an event chain, which, uh... Fires that then allows her to get married, but... It doesn't exist just yet. We do start with a couple of claims. We start with a claim on the uh, Kingdom of the Iron Throne. We start with claims on a few of the provinces underneath that kingdom. We're going to make use of those a lot later on. We have Abomination of Incest, which lowers Temple Vassal opinions. And this is because we are from incest from our parents. And if we were to have a child, that would then mean that they would have Grandchild of Incest, which is a negative 35 Temple Vassal opinion. A vassal opinion penalty. You start with good traits though. Start with quick, attractive. Widowed isn't so good, it does give you minus 50% uh, uh, fertility, but I believe that goes away possibly after you get married, but I think it goes away earlier than that. Trusting isn't so good. Temperate's pretty good. Just pretty good. And authoritative is one that's just in the mod, which gives you martial and diplomacy, which is very, very good actually, because it has no downside. We can't get any ambitions or choose a focus because we're only 15. So I guess it's time to uh, let time move on and then that will give us some events. Uh, my liege, your wisdom and mercy are legendary. I've been appointed your regent. Not any surprise there. We had blood of Valyria happen to us. So we got a trait down here. We got poor military leader, which is expected. And we got blood of Valyria, which reduces national revolt risk. It doesn't actually matter because we don't have any land that they could revolt from. So Joffrey has said yes to uh, Sir Jorah marrying Lady Stanza. So that'll be good. That'll happen in three years if she's still alive. And, well, that could have some effect. The Valerian Freehold's politics was dominated by 40 families of great wealth, high birth and strong sorceress ability, known as Dragon Lords. They spoke High Valerian language and had great skill in shaping stone. Incest and polygamy was... A common practice amongst blood of old Valyria. I am the bl blood of old Valyria. Okay. So yeah, we're, 
Daenerys' campaign basically leads lots and lots of these events here. And then eventually we'll get control at a certain point in uh, her life. Like we get true control. But uh, our main things are events right now. The House of the Undying. In this city of splendours, you find the House of the Undying to be the least splendid of all. You behold a grey and ancient ruin without towers or windows, its crumbling form coiled like a serpent through a grove of black bark trees bearing inky blue leaves. Your companions echo your hesitation, urging you not to enter, but ahead lies the path to your destiny. Queen Daenerys must enter alone, says Pyapri, stepping out from the shadows of the trees. Take my arm and let me lead you. I am no child. Shade of the Evening You make your way through the darkened grove and are presented with a crystal glass filled with thick blue liquid. Shade of the Evening, the wine of the warlocks. You gulp down the potion and as the warlock speaks you are reminded of every taste you have ever known, and none of them. Within you will see many things that disturb you. Visions of loveliness and visions of horror, wonder and terrors. Sights and sounds and days gone by and days to come and days that never were. If you value your soul, take care and do just as I tell you. Take the door to your right each time the door to your right. If you should come upon a stairwell climb, never go down. Never take any door but the first to your right. The door to my right. You find yourself in a stone anteroom with four doors, one on each wall. A mold-eaten carpet, once coloured with whorls of gold, lies at your feet. Within the walls you hear faint scurrying and scrabbling of rats. You heed the warlock's advice and choose the rightmost door three times, each leading you to a room identical to the one before. It is clear you are in the presence of sorcery. So we'll do what he says, choose the door to the right. The Red Room you emerge into a long, dim, high ceiled hall. Along the right hand is a row of torches burning with a smoky, oily light. But only the doors to your left, and not but the only doors are to your left, and not all of them are closed. You tell yourself not to look, but the temptation is too strong. In one room, you come upon a feast of corpses, savagely slaughtered. The feasters lay strewn across the overturned chairs and hacked trestle tables, as sprawl in pools of congealing blood. In the throne above them sits a dead man with a head of a wolf and an iron crown. His eyes follow you with a mute appeal as you carry on. Only a stairwell down marks the end of the passage, and still the only doors are to your left. The first door on the right is the last door to the left. Intrigue plus one. You find yourself in yet another stone anteroom with four doors, one on each of the twisty stone walls. The floor seems to move slowly under your feet as if trying to tre trip you. You are gripped by a sudden sense of desperation, want nothing more than to be done with this house of horrors. But still, three doors lie before you. We'll choose the door on the right again. He told us always choose the door on the right. Mother, you emerge once more into a long, dim, high ceiling hall. Along the right hand is a row of torches burning with a smoky orange light. But the doors are... But the doors are to your left and not all of them are closed. Again you tell yourself not to look but temptation proves too strong. One room reveals 10,000 slaves lifting blood-stained hands before you as you race on by your silver. On your sil silver? Riding like, a, like the wind. Mother, they cry. Mother, mother. They reach for you, touching you, tugging at your cloak, the hem of your skirt. They want you. They need you. The fire, the life. You gasp and open your arms to give yourself to them. But at the last moment you realise you're mistaken and pass on from the vision further down the hall. Only a stairwell down marks the end of the passage and still the only doors are to your left. The first door on the right is the last door to the left. Your sense of foreboding grows as the scurrying sounds within the walls seem to get louder and behind you you notice the torches have begun to flutter out. One more gutters out and the darkness creeps a little further down the hall towards you. As you listen, you seem to hear something else sh coming, shuffling itself slowly along the faded carpet. Terror fills you. You must quickly decide which. Door on the right. Keep doing it. The Red Sword. You emerge once more into a long, dim, high ceiled hall. Along the right hand is a row of torches burning with a smoky orange light, but the doors are to your left and not all of them are closed. You know you will not have the strength to look away and you steal yourself for the vision to come. The scene behind the open doors reveals a corpse standing at the prow of a ship, eyes bright in his dead face, grey lips smiling sadly. Glowing like a sunset, a red sword is raised in the hand of a blue-eyed king who casts no shadow. A blue flower grows from a chink in the wall of ice 
and fills the air of sweetness. Mother of dragons, bride of fire. Confused, you turn towards the stairwell at the end of the passage. I wish to be done with this place. Intrigue plus three. You enter a stairwell, begin to climb. Before long, your legs are aching. Strangely, you recall that the house of the undying one seems to have no towers. To your right, a set of wooden doors are thrown open, fashioned of weirwood and ebony, and black and white patterns swirl and intertwine into strange designs. Very beautiful, yet somehow frightening. The dragon must not be afraid. The blue heart. You pass through a narrow door into a chamber washed with gloom. A long stone table fills the room. Above it floats a human heart, swollen and blue with corruption, yet still alive. Every beat is a deep, ponderous throb of sound, each pulse sending out a wash of indigo light. The figures around the table are no more than blue shadows, and as you walk to the empty chair in front of them, they do not stir, speak, nor turn to face you. Mother of Dragons comes a voice, part whisper and part moan. You find it difficult to summon the will to speak. You notice that suddenly none of them are breathing. Could it be the undying ones are dead? We live, whispered the answer, thin as a mouse whisker, and no. I have come for the gift of truth. Prophecy. Three heads has the dragon, the ghost chorus yammers inside your skull. Mother of dragons, child of storm, the whispers become a whirling song. Three fires you must light, one for life and one for death and one to love. Your own heart beats in unison to the one that floats before you. Three mounts you must ride, one to bed, one to dread and one to love. The voices grow louder and your heart seems to slow, even your breath. Three treasons you will know, one for blood, one for gold and one for love. Help me. Show me. Blurred visions. Shadows whirl and dance inside a tent, boneless and terrible. A small, a little girl runs barefoot towards a house with a red door. Miri Mazdur shrieks in the flames, a dragon bursting from her brow. Behind a silver horse, the corpse of a naked man bounces and drags. A tall lord with copper skin and silver hair stands bef beneath the banner of a fiery stallion, a burning city behind him. Suddenly, black wings buffet around your head and suddenly the visions are gone, ripped away. Your grasp turns to horror, your gasp turns to horror as you spy the undying all around you, blue and cold, whispering as they reach for you. All the strength leaves your limbs and you cannot move. You feel a hand on your breast, teeth that find the soft skin of your throat. A mouth descends on one eye, sucking, biting. Dracaris! Breath of the Undying. Indigo turns to orange and whispers turn to screams. Perched above you, Dr Drogon spreads his wings and tears at the terrible dark heart, ripping the rotten flesh to ribbons. His head snaps forward, fire flying from his open jaws, bright and hot. You can hear the shrieks of the undying as they burn. They're high, thin, paper voices crying out in tongues long dead. The whole room is ablaze by the time you reach the door and call your dragon. When you spill out into the sun, the bright light makes you stumble. Looking behind you, you see tendrils of smoke forcing their way through the cracks in the ancient stone walls of the Palace of Dust. Howling curses. Pyat Pri draws a knife and dances towards you and suddenly you hear the crack of Drogo's wh whip. Never was a sound so sweet. Okay. The Silver Bell. The undead are dying, burned to ash by Drogon's flames. The tiny Kalasar celebrates your victory by braiding your hair with a small silver bell. But this victory is not without cost. The Carthian are up outraged. Their faction rulers unite to demand your exile from the city. Your host, Zaro, pleads with you to flee with them to the Jade Sea. But you refuse and he ang angrily sends you away. If your last friend in Karth, a friend no longer, you hurry to the docks where Sir Jorah has been searching for ships. Ships you find, but allies also. A huge eunuch named Strong Belwis and his aide squire, Arston, who intervened to save you from the assassin. They explain that they have been sent by your old friend Illyrio with three ships to carry you back to Pentos. At least the ships don't smell like cheese. So we get some new members in our court. We get Grolo and Belwis. And we're going to get another event coming up any second now. Oh, there's some new septums. We have a new heir. Uh, I'm not entirely sure these are chosen. It says open elective, so I guess um, the people below us can vote. But we're fine. We also are uh, currently in Karth because our liege is the head of Karth. So we get a different law here. 
So, in theory, if we were to stay in Karth, we would be possibly able to somehow get in here. Although only males can inherit, so it's not really a good strategy. Okay, we have a new heir. We will play as Sir Jora. Make up your minds, people. Oh, he's dead. That explains it. Well, we lack a guardian. Let's find someone else to educate us. We will be educated by someone with a good trait. Ooh, brilliant steward. Could be good. That's uh, a fourth level. Uh, we'll go with that. Yep. That seems like that'll work. Slavers Bay. Three ships speed you to Pentos and promises of aid, but your experiences in Karth have soured you to accept in charity. You will not be a beggar queen. Dragons do not beg. You will take what is yours with fire and blood, but first you need an army. As you consider your options in your cabin, Jora approaches you and confessing love attempts a kiss. Much as you care for him, you do not desire him and spurn his clumsy advances. Keen to change the subject, Jorah tells you of a place where armies might be purchased. Astapor, home to the Unsullied, the finest soldiers in the world. At night your thoughts whirl as you question yourself. Leadership is lonely and you begin to miss Drogo intensely. intently. At least you have your loyal handmaiden com to comfort you. It's good to be Khaleesi. It is known to Astapor. So we've got a small choice here. We can go to Astapor, which is what we're going to do. And that means that Aelia falls in love with us. Or we can go to Pentos. Which would give us another set of events. But uh, where is Pentos? Yeah, it would that be over here. We're not going to do that. We're going to go to Astapor. I almost do my, ho my homework and my chores before I go to play. Oh, we got Diligent. That's really good. That's a uh, plus one to every stat, which means that we're doing very well on stat-wise. I think we get a, ho a huge boost of stats when we hit 16, so that should be good. And the new event will be any second now. There we go. Harpy's Bargain. The good masters of Astapor are rude, arrogant, and cruel beyond measure, but their unsullied are as formidable as the story of their training is heartbreaking. Particularly troubling is the tale of how they can prove they can kill for every soldier represents a murdered child. You begin to question using such men to reclaim your throne. Unsullied are also very expensive. Haggling through a pretty young interpreter to hide your knowledge of the Gisari tongue, you finally propose a trade that shocks your advisors. Every Unsullied they have in exchange for a dragon. The slavers accept your terms, though they demand the largest of the dragons. In turn, you ask for the interpreter as a gift, and they lazily wave assent. You soon free the girl and ask her to tell you all she knows of Astapor. My mind is set. So we get to Misandre in our court, and we gain the trait Liberator. Let's have a look at that trait there. Liberator gives same trait opinion plus 20, and opposite trait opinion negative 20. So I assume the opposite trait is Slaver, although I can't, I haven't uh, checked into that. It makes more sense. Uh, in fact, we could check that. Um, he will have this tra uh, slave trader. There it is. That'll probably be it. Right, next event. The exchange. You've agreed to a duel. You've agreed to a deal with the good masters for an army of unsullied, where you gain all unsullied, unsullied available, including the boys in training, in exchange for your ships, your goods, and Drogon, the biggest and healthiest of your dragons. You are now at the Plaza of Punishment to execute the deal. Your company has brought the goods in the caged Drogon before Kratos. Is that Krasnas? Difficult to see tell if that's an A or an O. We'll, we'll go for uh, Krasnes. And the rest of the good masters, while Krasnes hands over the harpy's fingers. The whip symbolizing that you now own the Unsullied Force. The deal does not work for me. Dracarys. So we become independent and they all die. The Sack of Astapor. A dragon is no slave and Drogon refused to serve the good masters, burning them to death upon your command. You did, however, receive the Unsullied and you now have three dragons and an army fighting the slavers of Astapor. The city is barely garrisoned and easily taken. You've liberated Astapor and the good masters have been killed. You now control the city. The former slaves look to you as the new master calling you mother. Now you're to move on in your journey. Yet before you can take your leave from Astapor, you must leave someone to govern the city. We'll leave, we'll leave a council to rule. That gives us 200 prestige and 400 gold. 
We get the Unsullied of Astapor, which is a large force. And we implement Slavery Abolished. We get a 3,000 man army in, I believe that's uh, on top of another army. So we'll merge that up. We have no heir now, because we now actually have a title. We have uh, the Castle of Worm Pyramid. Great Grass Sea. Still open elective, but that's fine. And we are... Um, no, nah, we're not. Oh, I thought we were 16. We're not. The Yellow City. You leave Astapor and march towards Yunkai, another famous slaver city. The Yunkai command a significant force of slave soldiers and mercenaries, among them the Storm Crows and the Second Sons. The city is made of yellow bricks, crumbling walls, and tall, staped pyramids. Their emblem is flying over the city, a harpy like creature, as far as you can tell. Yunkai is said to be able to. Yunkai is said to be able to field a significant force of slave soldiers. However, Yunkai is known for training bed slaves, not warriors. Before you are the wise masters and the captains of the mercenaries come to parley with you. They offer you as much coin to leave the city alone and be on your way. They offer you much coin to leave the city alone and be on your way. No, I will free the slaves of this city. So we declare war on them and uh, we kill the person they sent to negotiate. Right. So let's head up to Yunkai. Dario's Coop. As you're ready to begin the battle for Yunkai, before you're ready to begin the battle for Yunkai. However, Dario Naris of the Storm Crows was enthralled by your beauty and has come to you before come before you in the middle of the night. He tells you that he's killed two other captains of the Storm Crows, and now offers the company in the service of you. As he says, my sword is yours, my life is yours, my love is yours, my blood, my body, my songs, you own them all. I live and die at your command, fair queen. Your men are most welcome. So the other two members of the uh, Second Sons dies and he becomes uh, our ally in the war. Which is pretty good. Got a few, uh, 500 more men. Let's head straight to Yunkai. No matter how many questions I ask, Elia has, always has an answer and is ever so patient with me. Our relationship has grown and I feel as if I have formed a strong mentor relationship with Elia. This will be good for me. So we have formed a strong relationship with her. Which is funny because um, I believe she's also um, our lover. So she's our friend and our lover. Oh, how nice. Right, to Yunkai. Now we at... Oh, if, did I put... Uh, Leaders in charge. I didn't, but it doesn't matter too much because the Unsullied actually have fantastic stats. So I wonder if there's somewhere where we can see them. Um, it's not going to show us here. Uh, we'll look at that straight afterwards. But they are much stronger than the average soldier. Uh, we'll have a quick look at it now. The stats that we have here are... Right, hover over. Attack values 4.9, 19.8 and 5 are for the Unsullied and Horse, horse Archers. I wish it would just tell us uh, for the like, individuals, but it's not going to do that there. But if we look at, say, heavy infantry, that's 0 0.5, 6, and 2. Like, like cavalry are only, like, going up to 2, 3, 10. Like, it's really, they are much, much better than anything else we have. Uh, where are they running to? They're running to make, uh, milk, so we'll go chase. Oh, we should also put some leaders in charge of our armies. We probably shouldn't be leading. We're a per poor military leader. So let's put... Do we have any flankers? We have no flankers. We have some organizers. Which might be good. Let's put Holy Warrior. What does uh, Jorah have? Just Defender? That's fine. And then an organizer on the other flank. That'll work. Organizer is always good to have because it means that you can... Uh, just get places quicker, have less of this running after people uh, nonsense that sometimes goes on. Now they have another army over here which we will go and quickly get before we siege. And hopefully this will put us to a 100% war score. Ah, the Regency has ended, we are now 16 years old. So, yes. We're going to choose an ambition, we're going to choose win the war. That seems like the best uh, ambition right now, it gives us one marshal. Now, I've seen this, I've used this multiple times. I think it only gives you one marshal the first time you win a war. Although it's available every time. And then it gives you prestige each time after that. So we're going to choose win the war so we get our one marshal. And a focus. 
Now, we want to choose a focus that offsets the uh, fertility thing that we have here. That offsets widowed. Just so that we can have a chance of getting some heirs. Because right now we don't actually have any heirs. So, it basically means we have to choose family or we have to choose seduction. And we're going to choose family because it gives us uh, health as well. And uh, gives us a bit of diplomacy. It means that we'll be better at uh, keeping our vassals together. Right. Let's kill the army. I forgot to check. Do we still have poor military leader? Or did we get a better one? Uh, no, we still have poor military leader. So we won't uh, prove that. Chase after this uh, army here. Kind of head back around this way to Yunkai. Make sure that we hit every army on the way past. Just to give us a chance of winning the war before we uh, siege. Actually, if they've come, gone straight to Yunkai, we'll just head the quickest route. Important decisions are available. Send for a maester from the citadel. We'll do that. That'll fill the maester position we've got here. And it just automatically uh, gives us one. Hand of the Queen. So this is green, so I assume this uh, corresponds to these here. So let's choose someone who has high stewardship. We don't actually have anyone with high stewardship, but we'll choose a uh, Jogo. And we'll uh, obviously set all of these people so they can't uh, be in charge of armies, which I know means that we just deselected Jora. So we've got Grolo, Belwis, and I guess we'll put Kali as the other one. That works. Uh, Maester has been sent for from the Citadel. We're getting Lord Lester. I think that's what it's saying. Oh no, we're getting a learned person named Lewis. And he was the uh, person who sent us the message. Okay. Won that fight. I think we might actually be able to hit 100% before a siege. Which would be very nice. But I don't... Maybe. It's going to be close. 88%. Nope, he will not accept peace, so we just have to siege it down. It's a matter of waiting. And I'm going to end the episode here. Thank you for watching. Next time we will uh, finish our conquest of Yunkai. See you then. Goodbye.